Today we have a new meeting of the Esprit and Little Club. We'll be talking about the uh, uh, union programs and what will change in the between Minsk and Moscow. My name is Nana Dragantievska. I present the moderator in today's meeting. Our speakers include Pavel Matukevich, senior analyst of the Center for New Ideas. In the past, he's a chef of of Belarus in Switzerland. Hello, Pavel. Pavel Slyunkin, so analyst of the European Council on European Relations, former first secretary of the European Department of the Belarus Foreign Ministry. Anatoly Pankovsky, editor of the Expert Community website, Our Opinion, and Belarus Yearbook. Hello, Anatoly. Hello. And Valery Garbalevich, political observer of Radio Liberty. Hello, Valery. Good evening. The meeting will be moderated by Vadim Ajeka, representing the Belarusian Institute of Strategic Studies. Now I'll give forward to moderator of the discussion, Vadim Ajeka. Vadim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Natalia. Good evening once again. Natalia told us about the unmute. unmute. Well, if uh, somebody forgets to mute their microphones, Natalia will do that for them. Today we're talking about the, the infamous 28 joint union programs that have been discussed for many years. Eventually, we have the harmonization of the laws, at least according to the reports made by the Russian side. A lot has been discussed in this area. And we didn't know what it will end up with, whether we would lose the sovereignty and the Kremlin would get everything. But today looks like this process is nearing its logical end. Lukashenko and Putin have agreed at the at recent meeting. They have been approved further by the joint meetings of the representatives of the two countries and that we have to finalize later. Today we'll be discussing about the future of the relationship between Minsk and Moscow, what the future holds for us, what other third parties and external players will do in this respect. We have today uh, the consequences of Belarus 2020. We see the former um, staff of the foreign ministry of Belarus among the experts today. This means that we have multiple viewpoints on our topic today. Well, I start by asking the first question whether the union programs threaten Belarusian sovereignty or will they remain another high profile but empty plan in history? We'll make it in the order of expert presented at the very beginning of this meeting. We have two Pavels, so we'll start with Pavel Matukevich. Thank you, Vadim. As to the integration programs, I believe we should underestimate this document and we should overestimate it at the same time. I view this document documents as a process. In my understanding, the most important thing here is that this process, this integration process, renewed in August and September last year and the uh, harmonization and streamlining of this approval of these roadmaps is the significant event. We still don't know fully the content of these events, don't know about the obligations written there. We can just speculate on that. But at the same time, there's an important point here. 18 months ago, the Belarusian side preferred not to 
focus on these roadmaps. It was the political crisis that forced the Belarusian authorities to speed up the process of approval. And here, I think, lies the biggest importance of these roadmaps, meaning that the process of integration is ongoing. At the same time, I wouldn't overestimate them since this way or another, all the key points, in particular in terms of damages or leakage of the sovereignty, they have already been written down and the laws and regulations adopted at the end of the 1990s. The major documents have been the agreement on the creation of the union state between Belarus and Russia, which stipulated all the peculiarities of the newly union state, newly created union state, okay. starting from the anthem constitution, flag, and the joint bodies, single parliament, up to the possibilities of the single membership in international organizations. Luckily, majority of these major agreements, for this or that reason, have never been launched. But going back to the underestimation, meaning why we shouldn't underestimate the integration programs, I think that Belarus today is in a totally different situation, unlike the situation we had at the beginning of the 2000s and later on. 20 years ago, Belarus had some place for maneuvers. It had a corner it could hide into, away from the Russian integration um, harassment. We could uh, pretend we were trying to sit on two chairs and this way get some concessions from Russia. Now we are in a totally different situation. This level of pressure and uh, negative attitude towards the Belarusian regime has never been seen before. And the Belarusian side, in reality, has very little chance of uh, achieving some concessions from Russia or trying to resist its advances. In this new situation, Russia can afford relying on the factor of time and maybe the tasks that it sets in front of it today allow it to concentrate on the economic track of integration, put inside the political track. Although I believe these processes are interconnected because this way or another, we see the integration map picture and for the first time over the last six meetings, we saw a press conference and we know that the long-term negotiations lasted to six or seven hours between Lukashenko and Putin preceded that. We don't know exactly what they talked about. So in conclusion, I would say that I would say we shouldn't really, we should treat these documents really carefully and uh, consider them as a sign of the newly launched integration process. And in the conditions Belarus is has found itself in, it cannot be beneficial to Belarus par excellence. The losses, as I said, already put there in the agreements of, uh, that appeared at the end of the 1990s. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. I really like the metaphor about the corner where Belarus could hide from the integration harassment of the Russian Federation. This could similarly be called an abuse 
from the Russian Federation. And we have seen it in the region with Russia trying to do the same with its neighbors in the region. And neighbors been not happy with these advances. We'll now listen to the second Pavel, Pavel Sil, Slunkin. What do you think, Pavel, about the, these roadmaps? How real are the threats to the sovereignty? Are they really coming from the roadmaps? Well, I start with the short conclusions, give a tempo to my remarks, my statement. Then I slow down on more detail. Well, the first outcome is that uh, for the seventh times a year, we haven't had a notch loss. And uh, we shouldn't expect it in the near future. It doesn't mean it will never happen. Pavel Matsukevich knows very well and uh, outlined the possibilities of this scenario, at least, but at least in the near future, I don't see the preconditions for that. I don't see us moving in this direction. I mean, the loss of sovereignty. The well, second conclusion from me is that the vulnerability of Lukashenko is dependence on Russia currently is very deep, but not as deep, so deep that M Moscow could force him to give up Belarusian sovereignty, and which would lead to his loss of power. According to the latest events, Russia is not really keen on doing that itself. I think it uh, as a understood that it cannot force Lukashenko to quickly give up on its on his authority in Belarus uh, and the sovereignty of Belarus. It, therefore, it bet on the slow strengthening of, of the role of Russia in Belarus and will be forming the better future for Russia by doing this, well, hoping for the successful future. It's not because Russia is weak, but because Lukashenko is not as dependent and so dependent on Russia and the Russian economy is still more or less alive. He's not ready to give up in total. Despite that, we witnessed the trend on the deepening dependence upon Russia. It is not particularly fast, but it will be difficult for Lukashenko to get off this track. And he's been programmed to move along this track by his position. Possibly Lukashenko's tactic is that to uh, protect his and defend himself now, hoping that the situation outside uh, Belarus will somehow become different and he will be able to get out of the uh, this, uh, advancements advances from Russia. So here he's selecting the betting on the military card. He's paying with to Putin, pays Putin with active changes in this sphere, the military field. If we have time, I will dwell upon this point in more detail. The results of the negotiations between Belarus uh, between Lukashenko and Russia, Putin were presented as the historical in the Russian media. Uh, and the press conference said that again, we achieved something great. It's a uh, next step after the agreement of 1999, after the 28, the content of the 28 maps was published on the website, it became clear that there are, there's no significant advances. There are no significant advances. Uh, this, on the other hand, we should note that until we see the full text of these agreements and not the brief resume of them, but the full text and content that be used by the state bodies, we shouldn't really talk about the integration breakthroughs. I think it's too early for this. Just like saying that they are not a threat it's also too early. The most important thing that the legal status of such documents is unclear. It's not clear what they are made of. Uh, these are some agreements 
detailed agreements that outline the conditions, duties of the parties, some terms, um, or some uh, kind of the roadmaps to achieve such agreements on uh, talks leading to uh, signing of such agreements, which has a lot of various terms, unclear terms. The yesterday's statements very much show it, statements by Putin and Lukashenko. The parties has, have announced the single market of the oil products, integration of payment system, electricity, and uh, equal access to state services. But we see that there are a lot of the were bureaucratic euphemisms about uh, streamlining harmonization uh, of uh, single approaches, synchronization, unification, depending on what people signing this document believe this means, the future success of the programs depends on this. If we divide the sh short content and resume of these 28 maps, if we try to st put, structure them, we see a a block about harmonization. We see it mentioned in the financial sphere, tax regulations, economic side. Based on this, we can see that either the parties are not particularly interested in creating single norms, or they believe that it's impossible due to the differences of the systems and the interests of the parties. The second block, uh, could be called as unification. This is the word meant by uh, right there. It's not only the approximation of the norms, but as I believe it's the single foundation planned here. Here we see the regulation of transport, competition, tourism, the consumer protection, not particularly that interesting where concessions could be uh, achieved easier. Next block uh, is about integration. It includes the word integration in the title. According to their plans, the payment systems should be integrated. The state information systems on, tra on tracking, marking goods, veterinary, phytosanitary control. Clearly, it's a movement towards the joint control on the movements of the goods because Belarus and Russia is very close and their relations, trade relations and conflicts continuously arise. I believe here the integration is about uh, Belarus switching to the Russian product or creation of the single product, maybe based on the existing Russian one. On the one hand, these norms, if they approved the mechanisms of control will be joined. On the one hand, they'll be more transparent for the controlling bodies and increase the effectiveness of fighting contrabands and smuggling, help checks at the border. On the other hand, and possibly the Belarusian side hoped that the Russian Sikhosnadzor, thanks to the integration, will be more uh, will be not be that strict to the Belarusian products. But knowing how deep these illegal schemes penetrate in the Russia-Belarus relationship and how Belarus used to use these sanctions against Russia, how the sanctioned goods were shipped towards Russia, knowing all this, I really doubt that the success is possible in this area due to the huge number of the lobby groups or representatives of the authorities because they will be protecting their interest, including the financial ones, so that the businesses will not be threatened by anything. So their schemes would continue to work. How deep the parties are ready to go into implement integration will lead to this or that amount of success. The last block has two 
и второе words. слово единый. Да, это... Formation of the single. These are the most ambitious parts of. And here the parties said that they want to create uh, gas, nuclear energy, agricultural policy, electricity markets. This is the most controversial block because I don't really see how the uh, the problems that arose in the past could be solved that did not allow for, for creating this single market. With uh, natural gas, we had the deadline of December 2023, but it's not about the creation of the single natural gas market, but about the countries coming up with single uh, conditions for this market. I uh, I doubt that they will be developed by the deadline and this deadline will be postponed considering the internal dynamics of Belarus, considering this, uh, we have two and a half years before this agreement will be signed. It's like a pass to the future, hoping that in the future there'll be many more chances to create the single market. There'll be less contradictions and the compromise could be reached. I believe the parties believe that now it's impossible, but let's postpone this until the time where we'll be able to do this. The same tactics was used in the 2019 when the parties were passing from the presidential level to the government level. I think now they are passing this so-called ball to the future in 2023. A similar situation, even though it was not particularly discussed, awaits the joint markets of oil products and electricity. The nuclear energy market could be similar to achieve compromise at because uh, Belarusian market here heavily depends on Russia. But in everything else, I believe it's more about the willingness than the real possibility. That's it for me. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you for translating this from the bureaucratic terms into the uh, words regular people could understand. And I would like to give floor to Anatoly Pankovsky. Let's talk again about the maps. I can see Anatoly. The floor is yours. What do you think about these maps? For many years, I've uh, been monitoring this process, and sometimes it seems that behind this minitudes, and uh, I cannot uh, see the forest for the trees. So I need to again remember what this uh, agreement from 1999 was all about. But today's uh, agreement is the something similar to what was done more than 20 years ago, because it now we see this today's integration is uh, as a pulsing mode. It goes ups and down. It has its ups and downs because it's about uh, movement from the bottom to top, from the small harmonization at the bottom to a more general, as already been said by Pavel, the single things like the joint things like uh, single market of electricity and natural gas. The roadmaps, as they used to be called two years ago, or the union programs as they're called now, are the plans to create, to make plans. So plans to create laws in various spheres like the macroeconomic policy, tax regulations, and so on. Two years ago, Medvedev said, and the then head of the Russian government said that they will be filled with the concrete content until 2020. So nine more years. I think Mishustin decided to speed up the process. While in the past they spoke about the single market of electricity and energy market, 
they had plans on natural gas, oil products, and the single market of electricity. There were plans for it to appear in 2005 to 2006. Today, they're saying that we'll have it in 2023. We have two more years to, to go. And we'll see how this single energy space will be created and what it will look like in the two, 2005 it's like 2025 2023 is much closer so consequently the ass will follow the treat so it's uh, about the activities of low creation should continue because the this pulsing node as i said has been going on for over 20 years at least we've been witnessing it for over 20 years as to the since i said what at the very beginning what i wanted to say at the end since you asked me about the sovereignty unlike the word leakage and leak i'm not really against but particularly against uh, the leak leaks of the sovereignty either understood in the way jacques Baudin did because the streamlining and harmonization is good i mean rule creation in certain spheres is also good since the sovereignty we discuss now is not particularly clear who is the holder of sovereignty and keeper of sovereignty the people or the entity which is claims to be the people because the external limits are seen the, as interference into the internal affairs the understanding of such sovereignty also leads to the various obligations connected with russia or somebody else including the legal warranties and guarantees for investors and human rights and so on and uh, appeals to the external narratives is seen very much as interference into internal affairs while uh, the new norm of the international law introduced in 2005 like the, the responsibility to protect sees the sovereignty not as privilege but the duty to protect the people living inside the state and delegating this duty to the international community here this initiative is not particularly liked i so i prefer that the, there to be some leaks in sovereignty so there could be some in the legal sense there would be some harmonization of laws and not the it will be against the understanding of the sovereignty as the right for self-isolation i don't really touch upon the legal issues but it's the legal status of the roadmaps is unclear all the roadmaps call it whatever you want also the the agreement on the union state was not particularly approved by the united nations and doesn't have a legal status the status is unclear secondly it's unclear how to force this parties to fulfill this agreements even if the concrete programs are filled with 
this meaning, this content. The question is how to force Russian Belarus to fulfill that. Is there a party that could do that? Since we don't have any subnational bodies or supranational bodies, Putin said it could be, uh, this could be represented as a joint parliament, but it's unclear how we can form it. The same is true about other issues. We see that there are some achievements on the Union Rome in regular regulations. I uh, doubt that uh, we have a single market of natural gas in several years because Gazprom wants to have uh, uh, the right to manage the distribution channels to have access to the consumers where it gets this it's uh, super profits i don't believe minsk will give up this this access and i believe the russia will not do this so this dream of belarus to have the natural gas uh, at the price of the smolensk region will be still be a dream well Beatrice gas was purchased they registered this deal in the hague and this is important why because if minsk decided to nationalize this gazprom could uh, have uh, several uh, trains of uh, belarus kali or sugar uh, cane factories goods arrested to get uh, their profits and i uh, think the parties will use this opportunity for a long time okay. and we'll see the current trends continue i mean lukashenko and putin still in power this machine will work that's it for me for now thank you very much indeed uh, you mentioned the roaming regulations when we talk about some global things we remember that uh, the roaming issue has not been regulated well there are some changes there really. well it took them quite a while well last but not least we give floor to mr karbalevich Baleri, who has been following these changes and trends longer than we have been he really i believe remembers the perception of threats and back in the 1990s Valery Ivanovich, did you think this signing of the, the recent documents changed the situation the question arises why they managed to sign these documents i would like to remind you that in 2019 when they discussed the roadmaps for the whole year they never arrived at the, the uh, signing it although they have approved on the 27 or 28 of 31 roadmaps they never managed to sign it the belarusian side said that let us sign on those that we managed to agree upon and the remaining ones will keep discussing meanwhile the russia will give back the subsidies removed when the new video announced the ultimatum in december 2017 in brest but russia got stubborn and said no all the roadmaps should be in one package we either sign all of them or 31 of them or we don't sign any of them and the process stopped today or the other day the documents 
was signed. Why? Because both sides made concessions, decided to meet each other halfway. While in the documents in 2019, the focus was on unification. Today, as I see it, the major focus on harmonization, which is a different thing. These documents became more declarative in nature. Therefore, it became much easier to approve them and agree on them. The contradictory points that existed, they were put in the sidelines. Let's say the Belarusian side insisted on these documents, saying that the, starting from a particular year, Belarus will buy the Russian gas on the internal price of Russia. Now it's put in the program which says about the creation of joint market. It means that both parties were interested in signing something these days. Why? It is all due to some political reasons, internal political reasons. There will be soon elections in the state Duma in Russia. They should be a sign of the victory, political victory. As to Belarus, the Belarusian side is much more interested now in getting support from Russia, particularly after the Belarusian foreign sanctions, Western sanctions get enacted, and the Belarus wants to get a serious financial compensation, much bigger than the one mentioned during press conference. Thus, the documents were signed. As to the the sovereignty issue. This issue is really is particularly relevant because all international unions limit the sovereignty. And the closer this connection, the more each party is looking at the partner. The integration of Russian Belarus is so deep now that any steps in this direction mean further limitations of the sovereign policy. It is clear that these programs strengthen the influence of Russia on Belarus, even by the fact that that whatever, however declarative they are, they form an inst institutional connection, strong connection to Russia in the economic sphere, even though there are no regulators or supranational bodies the negotiations platforms and negotiations agencies in 28 areas this way or the other they uh, will be limiting belarus in their macroeconomic policy or at least force belarus to consult its partner in this respect that should be it for me for now Thank you, Valeria Banovich. Indeed, all the connections lead to limitations. It's not that bad in itself. But if there are rules, they need to be followed. I would like to continue not about talking about not only the roadmaps, but I would like to discuss the dependence of Belarus on Russia because I believe that while in the public sphere we see a lot of declarations about harmonizations, there are processes that don't look that seriously, not involve meetings between the presidents, but they influence even more the situation. So I'd like to discuss the prospects of the economic and military influence of Russia on Belarus. I mean here the shipments of Belarusian potash into the through Russia's ports and strength of the Russian military influence in the form of the joint military centers. What are the prospects of this strengthening of uh, 
economic and mutual influence and how far can it change the balance of relations between the two countries because we know that these agreements have been around for a while not much will change but how will this change the balance of powers the president of kyrgyzstan recently said at the meeting of the joint military meetings he asked what to do when if one of the partners attacks each other there was a meeting of the cfto will this cooperation be a threat how much Pavel Matsukevich, let's follow the same order these risks that president of kyrgyzstan mentioned are really are a reality in uh, that region but CSTO is aimed at preventing threats in the middle of central asia again going back to the sovereignty issue we should say that presenting the agreement in the military sphere between russia and belarus is not really pleasant for belarus because strengthening of influence of russia this or oh, that way limits the sovereignty of belarus simply because the foreign soldiers are in a third of another country thus we see the attempts of the mass media outlets to draw attention to the integration programs or the roadmaps the contents of which is unclear to us but we're trying to analyze it and decipher it while on the sidelines there's something is going on but i'm afraid that the major process has developed been on the sidelines outside the spotlight where the head of state uh, telling the integration fairy tales and one of the agreements there on the sidelines is already being outlined and uh, gets it shaped if we remember we recall about the military trading center in Negrotna. that uh, involved the uh, russian military units being placed there and the fact that the uh, changes in the military sphere are happening are also connected with the fact that belarus is seriously planning to buy like serious weaponry from russia like as 400 anti-missile complexes and their warplanes this fact shows that the military sphere there are some changes because in the past it was very difficult for us to purchase the old s300 anti-missile complexes and it was a outstanding achievements at least was perceived this way i think the presence of the russian military base doesn't have a particular meaning from the point of view of the war and peace it doesn't change much but this has a major significance symbolical significance because the the russian soldier in this territory means that control is exercised on this territory and the prospects of belarus as an independent sovereign state are looking not particularly bright even though we agree that we should make concessions and um, but this fear should be out of the question we have been trying to avoid it for many years but it's a reality now as to the economy the situation is quite uh, sad because now the half of the person export services is aimed towards russia Ex i mean export goods as well not because the number of russian Belarusian goods will increase 
I mean, going to Russia, but the amount of goods going to the West will be limited. We, the influence of sanctions is here. It is seen in the canceled agreements and contracts. Today it means that the export volumes will be down next year. Well, depending on the economy sector, where this happens, and that's our dependence on Russia. Dependence in Russia is growing in the sphere such as the foreign trade, which is particularly sensitive for Belarus. I wanted to say something else, but uh, I think it will come to me. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you for a note in the purchase of the weaponry. I think the, the problem here is that when Belta was writing about this, she mentioned such these words and this quote, Lukashenko said that we have agreed on shipments that Russia will help us. So I, I don't think that Lukashenko will allocate billions of dollars to buy uh, military weapons and military goods. So Lukashenko believes that they, they will, those will get it for free or with a big discount because in the past we were protecting from the West and now we have to protect it from the Ukrainian side. And if Lukashenko hopes it will get for free, there's a chance, there's a chance that he will he'll be wrong. Let us ask Pavel Slivkin about the purchases and about the influence. Since you said that you wanted to add something. Well, I believe that uh, the space for integration in the military sphere, in the space for mutual concessions, not crossing the red lines is wider than in other spheres. As I see, the number of contradictions in fewer here, considering the current economic crisis when Belarus is conducting anti-Western policies. I already mentioned that Lukashenko selected the military sphere to pay Putin off. He believes that making concessions here, he has not given up much of its of Belarusian sovereignty. So the, the act of integration here could be promoted further because the military sphere is not part of the official part of the integration. It's mostly discussed at the level of the ministries and the heads of state. We already mentioned that the military pro, the union programs don't contain the breakthrough agreements. We see that a certain vacuum in the military sphere after relations between Belarus and NATO suffered a blow and the prospects of the relations between Belarus and the NATO in the face of the Lithuanian Poland that we had in the period from 2014 to 2020, it uh, ceased and we see vacuum uh, where Belarusian authorities are promoting anti-Western rhetoric that is selling to Moscow. I believe that it explains why the possibilities for a compromise is wider since uh, the vacuum is here, Lukashenko thinks it should be used. The two military facilities of Russia and Belarus used to be there and they're still here. Two more will appear. I'm not a military expert to give advice here, but as I understood, based on the information provided by the people who know more about this, these uh, the current centers that we're discussing are more uh, like the not educational centers, but uh, fighting centers. The number of the Russian military will not be limited by the teachers and instructors. 
so uh, they will be the experts capable of using them the military equipment there will be hundreds of people not tens of them and i believe that the, the military integration is not promoted by uh, russia alone based on on the background of the conflict with the west Lukashenko is ready to show how far he can go. I don't think Lukashenko will be able to frighten anybody by the Belarusian army, but they could use the Russian army as a threat, saying that, look at my lies. So if you continue to attack me, we'll integrate further with Russia and more of the military equipment will appear in Belarus and the original status quo will be even worse. So this, so this in famous uh, slogan, which became a meme in the internet saying that stop now is uh, very relevant now. Lukashenko, as Pavel said, is not interested in limited his uh, military power inside Belarus. So it's more of a game. When everybody wants to fool everyone, everyone else, when uh, everyone is trying to play and uh, fears of somebody else. Russia has a particular interest here. I believe the agreement of Russia to sign the union programs as they were signed and they were approved by the governments shows that the, in the military uh, agreements that make russia happy it, as to the economic part it, all, it will all depend on the sustainability of the Belarusian economy despite the forecast i uh, think people, particularly those living in Belarus, have been following the economic trends for a while. I remember the stories about the collapse of the Russian economy that appeared 15, 20 years ago. I was particularly focusing on that then. People used to say that uh, in 2011, when the financial crisis, financial downturn struck Belarus. People used to say that the Belarusian economy would collapse. It turned out that it never did. Despite the huge number of structural issues, Belarusian economy is still there. It repeated in 2020. People started saying that the Belarusian economy is collapsing. We have lost investments and the Western support and the Russian would uh, blackmail us. Over a year has passed after foreign investments stopped and the Russian program has started leaving the country. But if we look at the exchange rate of the Belarusian ruble, we will not feel or witness the collapse of the Belarusian economy. At least people still get their salaries. According to the economists who know much more about this, this me than me, the systemic problems they accumulate and uh, where well could be that at some point in the future this will lead to economic crisis but it's not happening now this economic kind of stability allows lukashenko to feel relatively sure of himself and allows him to ad attack the western countries and be more assertive toward putin at the same time I think Russia also has a particular interest. Even though there are no people protesting in the streets, I believe there is a, still a crisis. It shifted from the active phase to the more sleeping phase, waiting for a new outburst. Russia is interested here not to add uh, 
economic crisis to the political crisis because the sudden loss of Lukashenko, which can result due to one or both of the crisis, is not in the interest in Russia. So Russia will help Lukashenko keep afloat. But Russia also hopes that uh, Lukashenko will make more and more concessions due to this. Thank you, Pavel. The forecast that the Russian economy would collapse very soon have been around for many years. We see some raised hands and questions. We'll let other speakers to comment and then we'll have a q a anatoly would you think the strengthening of the military and economic influence how significant is it and will it force the picture to change or is just uh, another stage of what has been happening for the last 20 years the previous speakers has said a lot here makes it easier for me to comment now. Indeed, we see some facts of uh, dependencies on Russia being strengthened. Moreover, we can say that there is some outsourcing of sovereignty functions to Russia. So the foreign political infrastructure is inactive. We see Mr. McKay playing the role of a TV anchor. So uh, we have to communicate with the West, the, the collective West, as uh, called by Lukashenko, through Russia. All the political technologists, all the journalists, that started in August, it continues. Yes, we uh, ship potash fertilizers. Due to the sanctions, uh, Lithuania is closing down in this route. So we give in this more shipments to Russia. In the economic sphere and uh, we witnessed the dependency growing. I can uh, tell you uh, the, the story about the future of those in Russian relationship. I'm not confident that this will end of a particular acquisition and this uh, absorption. If we draw the graph on the picture and the paper, we'll see that it will not be a catastrophe. As to the military sphere, I'm not an expert here. Andrei Parutnikov is one, as you rely on his opinion. Even though I don't always agree with him, he notes that the military drill in the West 2021, a significant event preceding the elections to the military, to the Russian parliament. It uh, turns from the bilateral event between Russia and Belarus into a multilateral event involving Armenia, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, even though it's called uh, the West. And uh, I think it was the thought of Kremlin to do, turn it into this kind of event because the Tajikistan and Tajik representatives uh, I look in, in a very special way here. 
and the, remember the meeting of Lukashenko and Putin in Sochi, where Lukashenko said, let's increase the number of military drill, to which Putin said, well, we have enough of them planned. Let's keep it this way. What was I saying? Yeah, the sales of the weapons. As I said, I'm not uh, sure, not sure whether this media event could be seen as something significant in terms of the sovereignty laws. The joint protection from foreign threats could be seen as part of it. So part of the, our 28 integrations. Since we don't have one big integration, but 28 smaller ones. There's nothing new here, considering that we have a single defense center. As to the military base, there's nothing concrete in the agreements and documents signed. There is some vague description about the military assistance, although this structure has been around uh, for many years in the framework of the CSTO. And, uh, And if we talk about the sovereignty here, and the people have not been informed about this, but finally the website of the Russian government features the name, the titles of such programs, where we can read about the economic policy and tax regulation. So the conclusion here is that in we witness the increased dependency. We see some leaks in the sovereignty, but I don't see signs of the catastrophe. So, no, so there are some leaks, but the ship is still afloat. We're trying to fill the holes. Not us, but somebody else for us. Thank you. Thank you, Anatoly. When it turned out that there will be 28, I uh, felt it was something wrong uh, because we expected 31 of them. Valery Ivanovich, in the past, we've seen a lot of attempts of the military and economic integration. For many times in the past, people said that this is, or that has changed the situation. This current strengthening, could, cha could it change the balance? Was it part of the general trend? I mean, this um, joint military center. I think this process will, in many ways, depend on the internal developments, the political developments in Belarus. We see that uh, in the past, Lukashenko used to sit on the two chairs at the same time. Now it, the relations with the West have been broken and it leads to his stronger dependency on Russia. But I would like to remind you that him sitting on two chairs started in 2014. Before the Crimean conflict, Lukashenko was very much in conflict with the West. I agree that today's level of conflicts is much more significant, but still, uh, the vulnerability of the Russian Belarus regime here, uh, in many ways, connected with the lack of legitimacy. And this factor is as significant as the conflict with the West. Going back to the programs, I would echo what Anatoly said, that the political model that we have in Belarus today, the economic model as well, all the foreign limits and limitations look like a 
threat of destruction and uh, particularly threaten the, the Belarusian social model with the particular management style. It is threat, threatens the Belarusian macroeconomic policy. If Belarusian authorities cannot manage its own deficit balance, balance of deficit, and other financial figures, like the refinance, uh, refinancing rate, I think it will lead to destruction of the Belarusian economic model. And it will, it will threaten the harmonization of economic policy with Russia. Undoubtedly, the military dependency is strengthening. But see how Lukashenko is trying to and uh, it's not the military base it's presented not like military base but it's some strange happening why not openly sign this agreement He's masking it. I see that this is done uh, to scare the West. And if we remember this, the address of Lukashenko to the military in the range where he said that we, together with Putin, will show the West how strong we are. It's like Pavel said, Slitin said, we see some blackmail of the West, but I would like to focus here on the serious change in the policy towards Ukraine, judging by what Lukashenko recently said. Ukraine is now a military rival, which wasn't there in the past. Lukashenko used to say that uh, it's neutral towards the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And now Ukraine is a military rival and S-400 mounted missile complex is needed to neutralize it. That's it from me. Thank you, Valery Ivanovich. Indeed, the strengthening of rhetoric towards Ukraine is a particularly drew attention of anal analysts in Ukraine because uh, Ukraine knows that the th threats of this kind are not empty words. They not know why, why Lukashenko is saying that to spite the West or to get some kind of concessions, but still. Now we're moving to the last question to be discussed and short, namely, how will the signing of the union programs be perceived in Belarus and in the West? considering the, will it be perceived a serious step or is Lukashenko nothing to lose here and the West cannot be surprised by anything. Be brief. Uh, particularly answering about the reaction of Lukashenko. We'll follow the same order. Going back to the contents of these documents, it, it's unclear. I don't think Europeans will be judging by, about it with no information available. But I think they're much more worried about the changes and strengthening of the military presence of Belarus 
and then any integration processes programs in the economic sphere moreover we shouldn't exclude the fact that uh, they could be beneficial to belarus to the belarusian businesses working with russia we should also understand that in the heyday of our relations with the west the, the west perceived belarus as the country also supporting the Russian interest and the latest event strengthened this perception. Here it is uh, something that quite clear since the sanctioned policy of West is ignoring the country arguments that the further pressure on the Belarus will push Belarus further into Russia. So talking about the integration programs is not so important, but the military presence is like the symbolic gesture that will give all the rights of the for the West to believe that Belarus is a representative of Russia. Pavel Slunkin, please. I will divide this into two parts. I agree with what Pavel said about the uh, unclear content on, of the program and the reaction of the West will depend on the content. One harmonization of the tourist industry is one thing. And the creation of the supranational body is another thing, be it in the energy sphere or somewhere else. The second part is that what we believe the West is. If you if you mean that it's Lithuania in Poland, they have the the countries that are outside the Belarus, their neighbors. They know what Russia is historically. So the assessment of the potential approximation and the closer relation will be one will be totally different to the perception in Spain and Germany. Consequently, for Lithuania and Poland, when the relations became better, I remember what the former head of the foreign ministry said. I used to work in the Belarusian embassy in Lithuania. Mr. Linkiewicz then said that the Belarusian sovereignty and the independence was in status. I think it was in 2017 when the relations between Russia and Belarus were not the best. It's hard to imagine how the sovereignty loss is perceived in Vilnius and Warsaw, I mean, the Belarusian sovereignty. Um, Germany particularly is interested in the stability in the region, I believe, and I will mention that as well. Thank you. I would like to give floor to Anatoly now. No, there's Anatoly. We have to leave us now very soon. So I think it'll be concluding remarks from Anatoly about how it can be perceived in the West. Different West might perceive it in a different way. I'll go back to the brief history of the future. In the short term, there will soon be elections in Russia. And the trying to bring down the turnout to suppress the turnout so that the the spread just russia would uh, get through i think then there will be a, like a holidays for them and they postpone the starting until the next year as i said if these programs are signed there will be no instruments to force the part is to fulfill them that's my resume thank you everyone i'll have to go now and see you next time. Thank you, Anatoly. 
until he's there while he's here. I might say that when we love our experts, and uh, it's too bad that Valeria Kostigova cannot be here with us. We demand the immediate release of Valeria Kostigova, Valeria Kostigova and uh, other political prisoners. We are discussing an important major things for the country. Long live Belarus. Okay, goodbye, Anatoly. And before we have the Q&A, thank you everyone for being active in the chat. We give floor to Valery Karbalevich. Could you comment on the reaction of the West? How serious it would be? I think that the West has understood once again that this line of behavior and the policy it adopted, I mean, the EU countries and the United States towards Belarus is the right one. This uh, union progress will be another argument confirming that the Western policy towards Belarus is right and has been right. I think that these events and these documents are not considered as the historical breakthrough in Russia and Belarus, even though it has been made this way by Lukashenko, must be there. But compared to the agreement of the Union State signed over 20 years ago, it's not a breakthrough. However, a later this idea of, of uh, integration was so much devalued that the documents cited now are not enough to revitalize it. I think Ukraine is feeling much more worried, is it became much more worried. Well, because in the in the past Lukashenko used to say that the, no threat can, nothing can be a threat, no threat can come towards Ukraine from Belarus. And by announcing Ukraine recently a military threat and becoming closer to Russia in military sense, we see that the it's particularly unpleasant for Ukraine. Ukraine will react to this one way or another. It could lead to significant change in the Belarusian Ukrainian relations. Thank you, Valery Ivanovich. Right, so we uh, will start the QA and ask questions from the chat. We had a question from Yuri Dragahrust. We well, had questions to Pavel 1 and 2. Mishka Komarovska, Radio Razia. Right, I think now I'd like to give the floor to Yuri. Ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for the discussion. Uh, my question was has been partially answered by asked the same question to Pavel Matsurkevich. It's a bit different to what you said. Why didn't Lukashenko give up everything? You remember that after events of the last year, after the sanctions were introduced, after the meeting in Sochi, when Lukashenko was uh, uh, really looking pitiful, 
before Putin, many experts said that Lukashenko has given up. He has nothing to show Russia. The Western wing was destroyed. Why? I spoke recently with Mr. Putin, who in 2019 published a draft of the union agreement. Why they were unearthed? Why the current agreements don't have many information what wasn't present there? Fedor Lukyanov used to write that we'll put, we should put Russian military bases in Russia and there will be enough. Why the Russian military bases is not here? Why this tree is not getting broken? Well, Lukashenko is still the guarantor of the sovereignty. It's clear that he has been weakened that Belarus has become weaker. However, or did Russians not really want to go further or something prevented them? What Fedor Lukyanov wrote, what was there in draft in 2019? Why the regulator of the single market was removed. I think, hello Yuri, I'm glad to see you. I think that Russia is learning uh, its mistakes, particularly that it uh, learned its lesson while one person was governing the country. Well, Putin is ready to do anything for its power. The situation in 2020 was critical for Koshenko because a year ago he had to move around Minsk in helicopter. The external pressure, particularly at the time, was not critical since uh, he was used to that external pressure. In September, I had a feeling that was ready to do anything. I asked myself a question why he wasn't undermined then. It was clear that as he was uh, becoming uh, more and more controlling of the situation, he became uh, more quiet. But answering your questions, why the Russia didn't go further? Maybe it happened because that uh, this could lead to the bigger problem. Bigger trouble. And questions the issue of the military base is key here and agree to what Lukyanov said. And it, uh, this uh, change will solve all the issues once and for all, but Russia would not go all the way. I remember the recent uh, article by Putin about the unity of uh, three people, Ukrainian, Russian, Belarusian. Obviously, he believes it, and he wants uh, Belarusians and Ukrainians, after reading his wise thought, to believe it. Lukashenko the press conference also confirmed that indeed we are a single people, one people. I think that now because Lukashenko is uh, in a situation where it's not about signing particular roadmaps, but about the price he has to pay for retaining his power, even this military center. undermines the authority of Lukashenko in Belarus. Obviously, he doesn't want to 
see his status turn into one as a governor of the, some territory. He wants to have military planes, but I don't think that military said it was something that he wanted to have, but he was had to approve of it. And as uh, Malik Rebesh what, what rightly said, he's not particularly proud of it. Priorities given to some integration programs and the real situation undermining this, his status as a sovereign guarantor are put in the background, put in the back burner because he's forced to do it because in, the stakes are high in such game. Clearly the West bet on the, that this becoming not manageable for Russia. The West is also expecting the waiting for the Belarusian economy to collapse. But as we see, this will not happen soon, very soon. In September, it was totally different. I mean, last year, he was ready for everything. As soon as he regulated the crisis, dealt with the crisis inside the country, the game changed. I don't think he's particularly autonomous now. I don't uh, think that Lukashenko has this liberty to enter these negotiations because I at that press conference in Moscow, I was surprised how Lukashenko was surprised by the Putin's words that they should turn or address Lukashenko directly. And uh, several days later, at the shooting range, he said that uh, they should talk to me and I'm not going to talk to them. Thank you, Pavel. In the military base, we've got the military base in Belarus. Like one of the experts said that if the military base is here, the control is will be exercised. Uh, it reminded me of the Armenian scenario with significant Russian significant Russian control is seen. So the, this doesn't prevent uh, Armenians from selecting their own politicians. I wrote about this exactly. Come to think of it, this is not the scenario that Lukashenko is interested in, because in this, uh, this situation, not him, but the military base will be the grantor of the sovereignty. So Lukashenko is unhappy, not because of the military threat, but because uh, Russia will be able to relax. It will be difficult to get further support from Russia. I see another raised hand. Yes, it was me, Agnieszka Komarowska. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. For organizing the discussion. I'm considering the topic of today's meeting. I would like to ask a question. I am sorry that one of the panelists has left. My uh, question is about the sociology and sociological data, even though I understand that the situation is complicated here. But here's the question. The union of Belarus and Russia is uh, something that opening the space for discussion about the integra integration of Russia in other structures, or is it the other way around? Does it free freeze the discussion of this kind? 
Let's not talk about the relations between Lukashenko and Putin, but let's talk about the discussion that could be used by the society at large. Also, the another thing that was mentioned here, how people reacted into this. Can this be somehow studied? I don't know if you can answer this. That was the first question. The second question, more abstract one. You mentioned it several times, but this discussion looks absurd. There are 28 maps and uh, agreements that have not been seen by anyone. On the one hand, the legal format isn't clear. On the other hand, for over 90 minutes, we have had to discuss the military consequences of this. After the West 2021 or Zapa 2021 military drill, everybody will discuss what is left there, what real steps were made. My question here is the following. I think that instead of being forced to so the question is who is talking with whom considering the limited resources should we talk about another narrative which will be not only about integration of Russian Belarus but about the concept of integration of Belarus in, in other various international borders. So my question would be, uh, what do you think about it? I know that it sounds abstract, but on the other hand, if we consider the this uh, cooperation between Russia and Belarus, this process has been all around for over 20 years. We need to ask ourselves how pertinent is this issue. Well, on my last question, let's be brief. Yes. Crisis in Belarus, revolution, doesn't didn't have any geopolitical slogans in the sense that there were neither Russian nor EU flags present. We know that the value level is different, but my question is, do you see this the euro integration being one of the narratives here, because the EU, eu partnership has been around for several years there have been proposals and everybody knows what they are about there have been proposals from the eu in this direction and the fourth small question It's about Pavel Slunkin and your text about Belarus with uh, four players, including one of the players with two heads. I know that it is well balanced there, but 
when we say that there is Russia, Europe and Belarus, is there a, th there a threat that Насколько вам кажется, что, что эта угроза действительно сейчас тоже перед нами? Как бы, вот так There will be a single player to talk with. Thank you, Agnieszka, for all your questions. Let's start with Pavel Slyunkin. Because he was particularly clear about Hydra. And then uh, move to Mr. Karbalevich and Mr. Mitsukevich. And they will comment on the reaction of Belarusian people and the roadmaps. So much has been signed that Belarusians really don't know what is happening. I'll tell you what my article was about. It was about uh, two Belarusians. Belarusians appeared in the world map, world political map, after the crisis. One protected by Lukashenko, represented by Lukashenko, another one is represented by the civil society, by the people who voted for Lukashenko and who are represented by her. It is the community fighting for its political relevance, but cannot affect uh, Lukashenko's way of life. And his actions that could lead to the liquidation and the loss of the Belarusian sovereignty. And, this, and the other way around, Lukashenko has done, can do nothing about the foreign policy of the new Belarus, but the diaspora and the sanction policy actively lobbied by the team of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. These are two agents, who, foreign agents, fighting each other, but they cannot defeat one another. So without considering these two agents, it's impossible to find the solution to this political crisis. Answering the question of Agnieszka, I would say that uh, the temptation to hold discussion with Russia is there, but what, what do we consider to be as the West on the Europe? I be, I'm sure that Lithuania and Poland are not happy about such dialogue, but the weight of their voice in the EU is another topic. But Germany, however, is very much more inclined to hold such negotiations and talks. And you can see that the, if you look at Ukraine, the blackmail of Lukashenko, with the help of migration crisis and the, the military base could lead to a situation where this uh, situation will be solved without the participation of Lukashenko. The problem is that the Putin cannot solve the issue of Belarus in a second. This is a misconception widely uh, disseminated in the West that Lukashenko is a puppet of Putin. Lukashenko has been protecting his uh, power for over 20 years. What we saw last summer, if the revolution of Belarus was a success. What kind of influence would Russia retain in Belarus? Without a doubt, the economic dependency would not go anywhere. But the only channel and the major channel of Russian influence in Russia is Lukashenko. Lukashenko, however, does not let uh, Russia ex exert the full influence because he understand, understands that his authority in Belarus is unquestionable, is, is total. And he, if he lets Russia inside, the power will never be total. So if he lets in Russia, he can say goodbye to his total authority. This is the difference between Putin, a contradiction between Putin and Lukashenko. They both want to have total influence over Belarus. Therefore, they cannot agree on the full agree on the military basis. It's a cat and mouse game. 
would also like to add uh, the, something about the first question. If, if you want to understand what the Belarusian people thinks, we need to give the, the possibility to speak. Without uh, such possibility, you need to conduct sociological surveys that were banned in, banned in Belarus back in 2010. So the procedure is there, and this service can also can only be conducted by the state institutions. Chatham House does it with people who have access to the internet. Based on them, according to the latest cycle published by the Chatham House, the number of people who would want this, the union state to exist. Because what today, what we have is the union, but without the state. The number of people, the percentage of people who want to have a single state with a single flag is about five or less than 5% in Belarus. And here we can add 10 to 12% of people who would like to have a deeper integration, like a single currency and for the attributes, a single parliament and single microeconomic policy. So it's about 15, 17% of the population. Other Belarusians, I think they in favor of such relations being close, but not crossing the red line drawn by Lukashenko. He does not allow to lose the political control and he retains the share of authority and dependence. How, at the same time, Lukashenko does not support the thrive of Belarus, strive of Belarusians to get the relations with the U.S. as good as they there are ones with the Russia. In Belarus, Russia is the main lie, according to such surveys, but the EU also plays a major role. Belarusians wants to have the good relations with the EU as well. This, I believe, forms the future will form the future. Belarusians will not be ready to lose independence, even though nobody is asking them. Thank you, Pavel. Since there's no possibility to hold uh, ad hoc elections in Belarus, it's not available to us. Uh, it's unclear what will happen, what would happen. A man have manas hit is today Kennedy Korshnov, who used to head the survey, the sociological survey of the Academy of Science. Kennedy, if you want to add something, please do. Just a second. What Pavel Slunkin said is totally logical, it's totally in line with uh, what I could say. Indeed, the demand for the unification with Russia or with the West is not there. There is a demand for improved partnership relations. So what we are witnessing we have been with him for a long time. I mean, the trend, uh, the tendency of influence uh, and the importance of Russia going down and the demand for more equal relations with the West. It's all there. There are some nuances connected with the questions. If we consider what the National Sociological Survey asked, about the alternative to enter this or that union. The majority for now would vote in favor of Russia. But this is an artificial issue. 
this artificial choice. If we would give possibility to choose the real choice, the majority would say that we would say the majority would say that we would like to have the equal relations with the East and the West. Here, I would agree with Pavel. The number of people who would uh, support the relations with the West are about 80%, while the number of people supporting Belarus joining Russia or being close to Russia would be the minimum. And I refer here to the article present on the website of the National Institute of Psychological Surveys. The article I wrote once. It's about the lack, the total strive to get into Russia. It has never been there and since uh, the late 90s. It has never been there. So it's a paradox. Belarusians do, do not want to make a geopolitical choice. On the other one hand, it's a paradox. Many people are saying that, many experts are saying that the Belarusians will have to make this choice at some point in the future. But uh, I see here a different trend. I believe that this resistance to the imposed choice is the proper grown-up attitude. Unfortunately, the, we cannot really hear the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Gennady. I think we had a technical difficulties, technical difficulties, but we managed to understand what you wanted to say. Going back to the metaphors of Pavel. Uh, like when a girl wants uh, wants to, uh, is forced to select this or that man, maybe she wants doesn't want to choose this uh, make this choice. It may look naive, but it's an attempt to be independent and sovereign. Let's go back to Pavel Matukevich and Valery Karbalevich. Maybe they could answer some of the questions asked. A remark from my side, if I may, it will be about response to the question of Yuri Dekahrust. While Russia didn't go the f all the way, why didn't it force Lukashenko to make more concessions when he was weak? I think uh, even with all the cynicism of Putin and uh, the, the fact that he does not perceive the people as an actor, he saw that there was a change in 2020 in Belarus, that those people decided to become an actor, and it succeeded in a political actor. Trying to resist this change with brute force was not the best option. He would try to break Lukashenko, but what to do with the people who took to the streets? I think uh, Russia th sees this factor as the barrier to its uh, imperial expansion. Yeah, 
Thank you, Valery Vandich. An important thought. I, uh, Russia is considering this scenario as well. Pavel Matsukevich, please. There were a lot of questions. I just wanted to say that we need to understand that the turn towards Russia happened only because Lukashenko had the problems. On the 4th and the 5th of August, during his address to the people, to the National Assembly, Lukashenko said that Belarus will be developing a multilateral policy. And it's very important. The 9th of August, he said that Belarus had to buy and use sources from different actors. So even this person preferred to save his power and authority. As to the people, while uh, something is lasting for 20 years and people are not particularly given much attention to, the people want to act. Particular level of integration between Russia and Belarus gave some benefits to Russians and Belarusians, like the free movement and the recognition of diplomas. These things are important, but as to the non-geopolitical nature of the protest, we need to state that in Belarusian society there is a consensus that the Belarus should be equally far away from the West and Russia. Therefore, the pro the protesters were not ready to formulate the clear-cut geopolitical position. On the other hand, the Belarusian authorities once in a while understood that it's dangerous to make a geopolitical choice. We are moving towards Russia because we have to, because, uh, because of the economy is very much connected to Russia and so on. But it was clear from the very beginning to Lukashenko that is, uh, could, could be fraught with the loss with, of sovereignty. He has never been really welcomed in the West, but uh, I also believe that Russia would not allow us to make these steps based on the experience of Ukraine. As to the attempts to discuss something with Putin, it has some meaning. Any deal depends on the proposal and on the offer and how tempting it is. The migrant issue is uh, now worried for Austria, for Germany. In terms of Russian interests, there could be compromises. But it turns out that Putin and Russia have been manipulating the Western politicians by discussing this issue with the European politicians. He's keeping the Belarusian president alert. I would uh, briefly add about the European and the Russian flags and their non-existence of the Belarusian protesters. There's also a factor that uh, that you it's not so easy to get a purchase of the European flag in Minsk. It's, it's much easier to make a white, red, white flag. It, I do have an EU flag at home, but uh, I'm not sure there may many of those in Belarus. So if you want to make a big protest with European flags, it's not so easy, technically. The flag of the, the fact that 
it's so easy to get explains as well that non non-existence in the protest we're nearing the end of our meeting in the chat also so interesting question about the the northern stream natalia should should be asked this question about not stream or uh, one from olga simashka i think the question from olga simashka is not particularly relevant to our discussion but uh, we can read them out right okay the first question will be from Olga Simashka, and the second from Olga Simashka. The first question to everyone. Can we call Kremlin the major um, master of tomorrow's holiday of the people's unity? And uh, can we perceive that the recent events and recent as part of the imperial effects and could the, the recent events could be a foundation for the blackmail of belarus particularly connected to the transit of the natural gas but let's go back to the order of our style with start with pavel matsukevich as to the holidays, we need to understand that this is a part of the harmonization approach. While in Russia, this uh, holiday of the national unity has always been the anti-Polish holiday. Same is true here in Belarus. We became synchronized with Russia. I don't know if there is a hand of Moscow here. As to the unification, as to the pipeline, it will be very much dependent on the relationship between Belarus and Russia. I don't think it will be a threat to us because the gas, gas pipeline and the network belongs to Russia. It's in the interest of Russia to use it. But of course, it's a major tool and instrument of a blackmail, potential blackmail in the hands of the Russian Federation, despite the guarantees given to Germany regarding Ukraine. For me, it's an example of why we discussed the potential compromise between Russia and the West. We didn't consider the approval of the United States for this Northern Stream. If the Belarusian issue would, was of interest to the United States, they could connect it with the positive about the approval of the Northern Stream, which is an important issue for Russia. Thank you, Pavel. Next, Pavel, please. I, I do not believe that the national unity hold is connected with Russia. I think it was very much imagined by the Belarusian officials. It's clear that it's not uh, that much about unity, but about the unity of people with the Lukashenko authority. The repressed people has no, nothing else to do for the unforeseeable future. Answering the second question, the Northern Stream will be the tool of influence, not of blackmail, but in that of influence 
integral the integration the stream of the gas pipeline through Belarus could be a reason for crisis for con concession because Belarus and is also making money on gas transit natural gas transit like they did in the past it is very much similar to Ukraine because Russia and Ukraine are in the state of war and Russia and Belarus are creating a joint state, union state, but the problem is the same. Going back to what the president of Kyrgyzstan said uh, about the Russian, the role of Russia in relationship with other actors, it's similar. I think the National Union today is a totally Belarusian initiative. Russia has nothing to do about it, but Russia liked it, like the anti-Western, anti-Polish nature here. And here it's a rehabilitation of the motor ribbon shop pact, which is particularly important for Russia in the ideological sense, because according to the surveys, we see there's a harsh ideological discussions between the West and Russia regarding the Second World War. As to the this pipeline, we see there's an element of pressure because the transit countries have always been in the vulnerable position. I don't think anything will change much. As to the money that Belarus received for the transit of the natural gas, I don't think this is a big money. I don't think the decreased amount of gas transit for Belarus will negatively affect the Belarusian budget much. As to the Pavel said, why Biden in his talks with Putin did not use the concession of the United States regarding Northern Stream to solve the Belarusian issue. I think Biden connected this with the Ukrainian crisis. Remember when the Russian military approached the Ukrainian border and everybody was saying that the new war is imminent. The concession about the Northern Stream pushed Russia to let it go, so this uh, Ukrainian issue became much more important for the United States. Thank you, Valeri. Indeed, the Ukrainian issue has been raised a number of times during our discussion. We should discuss it at an, our next meeting, I think. We dedicate our next event to the Belarus-Ukraine issue relationship as well. We've seen that Ukraine is playing a major role here. Well, I think we're nearing the end of our meeting. I would like to thank all our speakers today who shared their opinions and answered the question. I would like to thank all our guests who have been great, as always. As like Mr. Korshunov did, they could join the discussion if needed. I would like to thank everyone who has been watching us, who has been asking questions, and will watch this recording on YouTube. And see you next time at the meetings of the Expert Analytical Club. Thank you, all the participants. Till the next time. Thank you.